So good to see all of you. I want to remind you, if you've been around the world in the last couple of weeks, we've been in a series of the book of Acts, and one of the questions I was asking everyone, everyone, okay, I want to know the why question. The why question why you'd come into this place every week or once a month or as often as you can. Why do you serve? Why do you want to be a, in a place like this, on a day like this, in a part of this world, in this season of life here? Why have you chosen to be in a place um, of God? So I want that, and just hand that to somebody on the way out there. In the back, there's a countertop, and there's a table there collecting all of that. You'll see it later, but I do want that for you. If you have not done that, take it with you. If you want to think about it a little bit as well, why? Why am I here? Um, what moves you to this place? I do want to hear that. And so that's going to be, bring it next week if you, um, if you want to take some time for that. Um, we're in this series of the book of Acts, and it's um, exciting. We're chasing down um, our small group on Monday night. Our women have a Bible study. They've been in the book of Acts for like several months now. So again, the ladies are leading this place again, um, but they're having a lovely time. And um, I'm so excited that we could just take four or five weeks um, today. And next week is going to be in the same kind of cloth of thought. But we've talked about the scope of the church that started in the book of Acts. The scope of the church ha goes um, through three spheres. It's going to go to Jerusalem. So at the last moment, Jesus said, I want you to testify to Jerusalem. And then he says, go to Judea and Samaria. That's the second sphere. And the, the, the third sphere is to the ends of the earth. It's actually, it means the ends of the age. In other words, don't stop. Keep going until we're done. So when you look at this, um, this story of the church, it's, it's just emerging in the book of Acts, you will see that there's a purpose. It's supposed to go around the world, but it needs to start right here and then in our cities and then to our world. How do we do that? What are the things? We talked about how the human mind is created to think and act in one moment. It's not two worlds. It's not about a theoretical thing and an active thing if you want to. It's supposed to be both. So our brains are created to think and do. Sometimes we can suspend that. And this church is an active thinking group. The, the second part is a sense of community. We gather together. We eat. We serve. We share. We grieve. We comfort. We work. We celebrate. We praise. We share Life together, a community. And then, of course, Transformation Chat was talking um, about what happens in our lives when God can actually change a person significantly. Now, sometimes we have the slow burn of growth, the transformation that over time will be changed. And then there are these moments that are what we call pivotal moments where there is a before and after, and it's significant. And then, of course, today we're going to talk about the S of Acts, service. So as we do that, I want to think about service uniforms, okay? So let's look at uniforms. How many of you had to wear a uniform for, for work? Okay, some of you have to do that. There is a certain type of, 
Um, so I'm going to do a little quiz, maybe. Well, I'll just show you some um, uniforms. Uh, of course, uh, police officer uniforms, okay? You have a certain look, and it does change. But when you are wearing a uniform, you're actually embracing the values and the organization that you are Wearing the firefighters, we love our firefighters. I was talking with some of the saints across the street. We are blessed to be across the street from a fire department, and um, I met some new people over there. And um, wonderful nurses, they have that now. We have the old school, and we have the new look of for nurses, right? And then we have the military officers. They have different um, types for every branch of our military. A chef, I love a chef. They have to have the right stuff. And I would, um, I was going to bring a picture of me in a chef, as a, but apparently um, I was told not to do that. Um, and then there was a pilot. Um, pilots, uh, you know, the whole industry of airlines, um, they have that. And then we have lifeguards. And all the teenagers look, what? The lifeguards, where? Right? Yeah, that's right. No pictures for that. We need to keep your dis, um, attention uh, on point here. Um, so no pictures for the lifeguards, but they have to have a certain uniform, right? Um, and all of this, I'm thinking about a particular uniform that has bright blue rich blue dresses, and a white, stark, white blouse. What am I thinking? It is the Dorcas Society in Zambia. So when I see that uniform, I, will you have my attention. You have my respect as well. It's one of those, I would say it's the oldest order of service that we have in the church right now. It goes way back in the beginning, and we're going to talk about that. But what's connected with that uniform is a concept of service, of um, a kindness into your community that's nourished, and a sense of complete integrity. I can have you story after stories of um, people in the Dorca Society. I remember one time I was leaving Zambia, and um, we had leftover cash, money. Um, we couldn't take it. And so I was trying to find a box of money for, for people, and I couldn't find a trustworthy person to have a box of money. And more, there were headmasters in charge of things, orphanages in charge of organizations, business owners. People had all different types of leadership, but the one person who was most trusted in eastern Zambia was not the pastor. Don't give him the money. Sorry, you give it to the Dorcas Society. I gave a box, maybe about three or four hundred dollars. It was about three million with their money, but it was um, a big box, and they were overwhelmed with that. But I received stamped letters every week at the church afterwards with accounting receipts stories about every penny that they used on behalf of people in the community. I received it for 16 months. I started to see this, like all the postage alone, they were paying for the postage out of their own pocket. You have my attention. The song that they sing, it's um, one of the beautiful songs. It's, I'll tell you the, the 
the, some of the words in 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 Chichewa is Zingipe, Chiwamba, Perpeni, and Mintere Oka. Uh, yeah, speaking in tongues. Any interpretation? No Chinyanja in the room. It means if you're going to go home to heaven, bring someone with you. What a beautiful song. You want to hear it? I want to show what it looks like at a giant parade in eastern Zambia of thousands of the Dorcas society marching into a coliseum. And notice at the end, it's a bunch of pastors at the end. Who leads it? Thousands and thousands of servants. People who give their time and our energy for the gospel. Watch this. I wanted you to see the whole song. I wanted you to watch all of them. I wanted to see your arms swinging in a march. These are the people are moving in Africa. The pastors in the back in their black suits and white ties are just there to bury, marry, and baptize and Get out of the way. 
because these ladies are on fire. <laughs> it takes a lot of um, training, cost, to be a part of the Dorcas society. It's not something that it's given. They pay for their uniforms. They save. It's about 15% of their salary for a year or their wages. They wait. They pay to serve. It's so remarkable. When I are going to read the story of what started the Dorcas Society, it's just not a name. It's a woman who started this in the book of Acts. But before we do that, you need to understand that this church was just growing by leaps and bounds. And in, in all of the growth, there's always going to be problems, right? We call growing pains. And in those growing pains, they had a particular difficult situation in Acts 6. We're going to pick up 6, um, you know, I think Acts 6 next week, but we'll just touch it for a second. But I want you to see it. In Acts 6, verse 1, you see the first major problem in the story of the church. It says in Acts 6, verse 1, it says, In those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic, the, G, the Greek Jews among them, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. This should have been given by the priests from the temple, but they were not getting money from the priests or the temple. They had to find their own resources. And as they started to bring their money into the place, the gathering moments, and they would have to distribute all of the food to orphans and widows, guess what? They were overlooking those who were not Hebraic Jews, Greek ones. We call that racism. It was an overlook. Moment. It was a perception. Whatever it was, they had to deal with that problem. So, fast forward three more chapters later. We'll come back to that next week, how that happened. But they had this problem. You'll enter in what it looked like a couple years later. Acts chapter 9, verse 36, and let's meet the beginning, the person who started this whole idea of the Dorcas Society is now a worldwide society, an order of service around the world. It says this in verse 36 in Joppa, there was a disciple. What kind? A disciple. A disciple of Jesus named Tabitha. In what? In Greek, her name is Dorcas. Why is her name translated for Greek as well as Hebrew? We just read why. There was a problem before. The Greek widows were overlooked. Whether she is a Greek person or not, she is in the result of that good spirit-guided moment to organize a ministry. So now they have to now look at everyone in their ministry. She was always doing what? She was doing good and helping the poor. Always. And about that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. So she, in her namesake, is connected because she is a Greek. Now, she was always and every time involved in helping other people. 
And there's a difference between people who are involved in service projects. Service projects doesn't necessarily mean that you're a servant. And when you are on a mission trip, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a missionary. There's a big difference between a missionary and a person who shows up on a mission trip. And even though you have a leadership position, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a leader. Who you speak out, one way or another, will define the perceptions of some people. But ultimately, who you are will come out of your pores at one point or another. And in this case, this woman became sick and died. And I had to have this question a hundred times. How is it possible that one of these greatest servants in the church that's so needed, so helpful, gets sick and dies? Ask anyone on this life, in this history, and you'll find out that everybody save two people died. So the one thing that you can actually count on in your life, unless the Lord comes, is you should expect at some point that you're going to what? It's inevitable, right? But in all of the inevitable things in life, do we are afraid, do we stop, do we hide, do we pause, do we postpone because of the inevitable, or the real people in this world that will make a change are people who, in spite of the inevitable things in life, you will still do things that are gospel, beautiful, eternal things to do. I see this in Tabitha. Always. So she did the inescapable, unavoidable things in life are coming. She still did the right thing. I just don't know a lot of people who live that way. I want Tabitha to be my mentor. Verse Verse 38, she dies. And if you think that why is important, see what happens. Lydda was near Joppa, and so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, he sent two men and urged him, please come at once, Peter And so, continuing the story, Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. Notice this. Imagine this. Take a second and imagine what's happening in the scene when all of the people come upstairs when Peter comes up there. What do they find? All the widows stood around him, and what are they doing? crying and showing him the robes and all of the clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. Can you imagine that? Holding up their clothes that they're wearing, things in their hands, holding and saying as a protest, anyone but, but not Tabitha. Why? Can you imagine that scene? So beautiful, clutching the things that remind you of her service. I don't know. There is this internal protest inside of us, isn't there? Even if you're 104 and you go to sleep and you're died, 
I still have students at college saying, my grandmother, great-grandmother, 104 years old, oh, how could this happen? How could it happen? She's old. <laughs> this is going to happen. Oh, and I tell you the truth. There is an internal protest inside of everyone, whether it's young or old, that we are not made to die. And so if you feel that, you protest inside. I protest. Because although this is inevitable on this side of this life, I know the story. I am going to see my mama again. <laughs> I'm going to see children that I had to bury. Stillborn. Children who are four, six, 17, 12. There is this internal protest. And it does say that Jesus, it just prompts Peter to do the courage thing. And he says in verse 40, send all of them out. Would you send these ladies out? Would you order them around? Do you see that army? Apparently, Peter clears the room and then he does the most important thing. He gets on his knee. And I see at the end of this, I say, why? Why Tabitha? And I think the real question is not the why in those moments. It's the who. Who is this God that promises the inevitable and the promise of the resurrection one day. This God who knows how this works. I need to trust that God, that character, that person. And in all of it, you see the who inside of this character, although she is dead. But Peter, in verse four, 41, he took her hand and helped her to her feet. She, he speaks to Tabitha and says, get up. And when he speaks up, grabs her feet and stands. Her eyes are open, sets her up. And then <laughs> you'll see who's downstairs. A whole bunch of people who want to know what in the world is going on. So what does he do? He brings Tabitha and puts him right in front of everyone. Is God going to place your lost ones into your face, right in front of you, in your arms? He's going to personally do that for us. Because that's what he's been doing it on earth. He will do it again. In the, but this is all about the uncompromising devotion of people who are in need. This woman was resurrected for the moment, and she died again. <laughs> but the story continues. Why? Because I do believe this order, this idea of service, it found a pivotal moment in this person's life. Do you remember um, that James says in verse James 1, verse um, 24? I think it was, it says that um, religion that is God, our Father, that accepts pure and fault is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by this world. There's a rela relationship for your service that you selflessly give to yourself 
to other people, does something into your heart and your character. This is not a legalistic thing. It is when you do something that's so central to God's character that you finally slip into your own skin that you were created for. I asked students, tell me when you were so close to God in your life. You know what? It's when you're serving. They say, it's when I'm doing something for else. Well, that does not surprise anyone. Why? The one thing that we love about our God is not because he's shiny. It's because he is selfless. And he came and redeemed you by his own blood. So that selflessness resonates with the heart of anyone. So the moment that you slip in to that skin, it finally feels right again. There is this this passage that tells us in Galatians. It's our scripture. It says, do not be deceived. God does not be mocked. It starts pretty bad right now, doesn't it? It's a warning. It's just saying there is a cause and effect in our character, in our lives, in our experiences, and the sense of our heart is connected directly to what you sow, something you will reap. Whoever sows to your flesh, if you're about yourself, if you protect yourself, your leadership, your reputation, all the things, in other words, no matter what, protect yourself, it will reap a harvest in you. Sadly, It'll grow and grow and flourish. But it says that if you sow to please the Spirit, the Spirit will reap what? Yeah. <laughs> so don't, don't become weary in doing good. <laughs> For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest, we will not give up. So therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do what? Do good to who? All. But no matter what, do not forget the people around us, the family of believers. Why? This looks like backwards, doesn't it? Are we supposed to take care of our, our, our neighbors first, right? No, we've tried this. Like in the 70s and 80s, they were saying, okay, let's do friendship evangelism. So let's go and try to be helpful for our neighbors, okay? So put on your smile. It takes you three weeks inside of a church to find out if there's fighting between people, you see the real heart of a believer. No, the greatest testimony of the Christian church are how we take care of each other first. Who wants to be a part of that family? I know I do. That does work. Who wants to be a part of that? Requires that uncompromising impulse to be about somebody else first. Not your schedule, not your finances, not your sense of comfort zone. It was about 10 years old, my oldest son, I took him to, to DC. And um, I was teaching him because I wanted to take some time um, See the uh, DC, so the different things there. And after we we're done, 
I did some work, and I was coming back, and we were gotten on a flight, and he was 10 years old, I think, 11 years old. We were making our way to the gate, and we were also running. And I don't know if you have ever had to run through the, um, the airport, but I have a young person with me, and I'm running. I'm taking his backpack and my backpack, and I had stuff, and he's still pretty fast, but I was trucking, and we were going to be late. The gate was closing, and we are going to be stuck, and so we were going fast. I got to the gate, and as I'm coming, I'm pulling out our boarding passes because I want to make sure, and I've just found out that at the You know, I had a frequent flyer for my son. Mine was, I paid for my ticket. I got upgraded to first class. He was not. So I'm walking, I'm running. Oh, no. The whole time I'm running, backpacks, he's huffing behind me. I was still faster than him at that time. Um, And I'm thinking, oh, no. Gates closing. I got to the front of the attendants. I said, we got to the door. It's open. We just made it. And I said, I said, I need to change seats. I, my son, he's by himself in the back. He says, and like, I got upgraded. He looked at me like I was a criminal. Like, how would you do that to your kid? He says, it was automatic. He says, okay, well, people, will, don't worry about it. Just go in there, trade seats. Nobody's going to have a problem changing seats with you. You're in 2B. I said, that's right. So I calmed down. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is going to be good. So I go in the back, and then I found out we go all the way back, and my son is um, trailing behind me. We're lumbering with backpacks and things like that. And I see, and I won't tell you what college it was, it's in the East Coast, and there was a basketball team at the end of this plane. It's, this is giant. Their limbs are just flowing into the aisles. It's like everybody there, and then And we were in the back there. My son's seat was right in the middle between both athletes. So I got there, and I said, the person on the aisle, I said, my son's seat is right there, had a head, bones on, a hood, he opened his eyes, and he rolled his eyes. I says, I, would you mind trading seats with me because I need to sit with my son? There was a mix-up, um, and I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to trade. I didn't tell him where the seats were, though. He looked at me and says, oh, I'm comfortable here. I, I need the aisle. I says, sorry. His first impulse is to be comfortable. I'm sitting here with a 10-year-old kid. The other athlete looked at him, and he punched him. He says, what? He says, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. And this man, his first impulse, he says, sir, he said, I would trade seats with you. He didn't know where the seats were. So he came out, stepped over his athlete friend, pulled in there, I put my son into the corner, and I put in the middle seat, and I gave my boarding pass. I said, it's up there. Just follow this. And he just grabbed it, and he didn't even read it. I was that direction. So he starts walking up, and the whole time, I am, like, watching him. The guy next to me in the aisle is asleep already. He doesn't see it. Heads, earphones, hoodie, asleep. (laughs) He tried to put his head on me. I'm not doing that. The whole time this young man starts going up to the front, his seat is what? To be. He's walking up, and he gets closer and closer, and you know what's coming up? It's the curtain. You know the curtain, right? On the other side of this curtain is a different world. Most of us, we live on the other side of this curtain. He gets up to that. 
he peeked in there, and he's looking up to find the numbers. And he looks it again to the boarding pass. And then I'll tell you exactly what he's. He turned around and he goes, <laughs> opens up the curtain. It was like Shekinah glory comes out of it. And then he closes it, sits down. The story ends later when he came back about an hour and a half later with a plate of food on China, a full plate of food, ceramic plates, and he came back and it had on the corner a thing of um, it was chocolate mousse. You know, it takes like six hours to make moose, real, really good moose. So he comes back there, and he wakes him up, and I'm thinking, I got to see this. <laughs> he starts eating his food right in front of him. He said, this is great. Did you try this? What did you have? And he looks at this little wrappers like bones, you know, on, on, the, on this tray, a couple pretzels and things like that, and he says, this is chicken. I've had three of these, and I've had two desserts. They just keep feeding me over there. What? And this guy woke up, and he started to say, what? Where are you? What's going on? And he says, to be. To be or not to be. <laughs> so this guy says, you're in first class? He says, Exactly. He looks at me. What did I do? I bunk out. I pretended I was asleep, but I had this little smirk on my face. Most importantly <laughs> about that whole story is that I love that first impulse, that first moment that one person said, no matter what, I'll trade. You should sit with your son. That's golden. That's priceless. That is the one thing that has moved this good news to the world. If we are ever going to move from 100 people, 150, 200 people as a congregation to move into a place, our first impulse needs to be not about our comfort zone, our position, our status, or even our own sense of security. It's going to happen because our first impulses are others.